Today's video is brought to you by BetterHelp. Hey, brother! Today's episode will contain spoilers for Loki episode two. Oh man, you guys, Loki episode two is out and there are so many new details to pick apart and I'm sure what is just going to be the custom for this season, maybe more questions than answers given. One thing that I absolutely do know for sure though is that I am loving it. Tom Hiddleston and Owen Wilson are like magic together. But seriously though, the questions, like what did C20 see that was just so real? And why is Lady Loki bombing the timeline? And also Lady Loki, called it. But also who is Ravana's other agent? And what is the deal with the snow globe? Or for that matter, the roller skate or the FDR pen? And perhaps most importantly, why did Loki one time win the Tour de France? I mean to tell you the Myojan, or for you English speaking people, yellow jersey does not come easy. Although it does come with like a gigantic plush lion, which is just pretty cool. Used to be a big Tour de France fan. Speaking of though, I am still not over Changate. Alberto Contador took advantage of Andy Schleck's chain slipping and just took off. No class! Truly though, if you've never been like somewhat informed on what's going on on the ascent to Alpe d'Huez, you are missing out on enjoying something a lot. But we're not here today to talk about Tour de France villains, although I could for a long time. Today, our big question is, who is the true villain of Loki? Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Guys, this past year has been difficult in more ways than one, and I personally found myself in the midst of all of that, feeling like I had no motivation, I wasn't enjoying my hobbies, and I was just constantly feeling anxious. And to solve that, I sought out personal counseling, which has made a massive difference in my daily life, and I feel so much more equipped for problems when they arise. And BetterHelp can allow you to do this same thing from the comfort of your own home by matching you with a licensed professional therapist. And because they have therapists from around the entire higher globe, sometimes you can actually gain access to help in a specific area that might not be available in your own area. Also, it is more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and there is also financial aid available. It is available for clients around the globe and on secure lines so that you know your conversations are maintaining privacy. Head on over to betterhelp.com slash super. That is betterhelp.com slash super and join the millions of others who have taken charge of their mental health by interacting with a licensed professional. In fact, so many people have been heading over to BetterHelp that they are now looking for counselors in all 50 states. Viewers of the Super Carlin Brothers show will get 10% off their first month when you head on over to betterhelp.com slash super. Again, that is 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash super. Link in the description down below. The second installment of Loki was just absolutely jam packed with Easter eggs and little nuggets for us to dissect. And if I was a betting man, then I would make the guess that some of these are exactly that. They're simply Easter eggs, fun nods to other moments in Marvel history. But I think some of these are also critical plot points. Like on the one hand, when Loki is studying in the TVA library thing, there is the number 372 in the backdrop. This is definitely a reference to issue 372 of The Mighty Thor when the TVA is first introduced. In my opinion, this is your perfect classic Easter egg. It is a number that doesn't really affect anything one way or another. You don't need to know that it's a comic book reference, but if you do, it's fun. On the other hand though, did you know that Mobius, Owen Wilson's character's appearance, is actually based off of real world Marvel director of continuity back in the day, Mark Grunewald. This one feels like there could be a little bit more to it because real world Marvel Mark was actually born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is where the Renaissance Fair is being held at the beginning of this episode. For clarity though, Mark wasn't born at this particular Renaissance Fair. He was born at the one in 1953. Okay, to be fair, I can't actually confirm that. He was in fact born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, but not necessarily at a Renaissance Fair. Probably. Even more interesting is the fact that if we again go back to the comics, Mark's legacy goes a little bit deeper than just the likeness of this one particular character. Because over in the comics, all of the other TVA agents are actually clones of Mobius. Or as he's also known, Mobius M. Mobius. Them stands for Mobius. Get it? It's like Mobius over and over and over again. Like a Mobius strip. So clever. I know. These details though can be kind of interesting depending on how you look at it. Like for example, Mobius seems to be the only agent of the TVA who doesn't feature an agent number. Even Ravana, who he seems to be reporting directly to, does have a number on her helmet that we see at the end of the episode. 
And again, with every other agent number, it seems like it's this combination between letter and digit kind of suggesting that maybe they're coming from different iterations. And I say iteration, but there hasn't actually been any indication in the show at all that would suggest that all of the other members that are working for the TVA are clones of the original Mobius. Like for one, they all look different. But I don't think that his lack of number is a mistake and it does leave us wondering, where did Mobius come from? And this question is something that Loki addresses directly and Mobius answers very indirectly. Where Mobius points out that him being made by the timekeepers is no less bizarre than Loki being the product of frost giants and being raised by the god of the heavens. But personally, I disagree. You can dress it up however you want, but at the end of the day, Loki was adopted. It's not that complicated. Whereas Mobius, on the other hand, it's like, what do you mean they created you? And are you sure? How long have you been here? I don't know, it's hard to say. You know, time passes differently here in the TVA. I'm sorry, Mobius, but I think you're a little unaware about something to do with your own existence. The other really interesting thing about Mobius in this particular episode is maybe unexpectedly his jet ski magazine. You may not really think twice about this particular thing. I mean, he makes a really great point. Jet skis are awesome. Does he? Like even Loki, who is a god, gets it. And he travels to and from the timeline all day, every day. It really probably wouldn't even be that difficult to snag this particular magazine without causing like a rift in all of time. Or at least that would be something that would be easy to understand if we didn't have this exchange. And why do you get to keep all the trophies from my cases in here? You don't think I'd love having that roller skate? Then why does he get to keep this magazine? The items that they're talking about are not really anything that fantastic. Like a roller skate out here in the real world is not very significant, but it makes me think the idea of having an artifact from the real world in the TVA is pretty remarkable. So, and you might be wondering this question yourself here is like, what does a jet ski magazine tell us potentially about like his character? Because myself included, I really didn't see this as anything significant other than like a fun moment of comic relief. Someone who comes from having the perspective of having seen the technology of always is most impressed with a jet ski from the 1990s. Like that? is the epitome of human innovation. In the early 1990s, for a brief shining moment, there was a beautiful union of form and function. Which like, yeah, okay, sure. But also newsflash, jet skis are not only from the 90s, they still make them. And I kind of have to imagine maybe make them better or did they like lose touch with the original purpose spirit of the thing since then? That's a real question. Do we have any jet ski enthusiasts out there for the 90s, the era? I want to ride one. I've never ridden one. Have you ridden one? And again with this, I don't think this is just like a tiny fun added detail. I think it might literally be a clue to helping us better understand where Mobius comes from. Even though at first you might just think that the TVA, despite being like the supreme power of space, what's bigger than space? Cosmos? I think it's Cosmos. Despite being this supreme power is still featuring what feels like pretty dated technology. So it could just be the case that for some reason, this particular era in history is what they settled on as like how they created the TVA space. The interior designer was like, you know what was great guys? The 90s, let's do all 90s. But that's not actually the case. The technology in the TVA is not from the 90s. It's actually from about a decade earlier in the 80s. And I personally think that this like set design decision by the creators of the show was incredibly intentional because the TVA is kind of like the watchdog or big brother, if you will, of the sacred timeline. Big Brother as in from the story 1984, the novel that kind of predicted the potential dangers of constant surveillance. Spoilers in case you haven't read it, Big Brother is not good. The point is, I am fairly certain the reason the TVA looks like what it does with the technology that it has is a very purposeful nod to the year 1984 and as such, the story 1984. And the point that I'm trying to make there is that Mobius's obsession with a jet ski from the 90s is not like so just specifically in keeping with the era of everything else around him anyway. If anything, jet skis compared to this tech would be fairly advanced, relatively speaking, of course. Can't be certain, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have time doors in the 90s. But the jet ski is not the only thing that we can tie Mobius to this particular decade. The other kind of glaring item that he keeps interacting with is a can of soda called 
Josta. I did not recognize this particular soda. So at first I thought that it was just kind of like a Marvel inside joke, Easter egg type of thing, kind of like by and large from Pixar. But it actually isn't. Josta was a real brand of energy drink that existed out here in the real world for a very brief run of popularity in wait for it, the 90s. And I think that if you pair these small details in the conversation between Mobius and Loki about where they both came from, and I think that we're starting to get small arrows indicating that for some reason, Mobius himself was plucked from the 90s. And now this could totally be a reach, but do you remember how we said that Mobius and all of the other TVA agents, at least in the comics, were based off of Marvel writer and director of continuity, Mark Grunewald, the guy who was maybe born at a Renaissance fair in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Well, Mark, real person out here in the real world, actually unexpectedly passed away in the 90s. Meaning the things that we're seeing Mobius be kind of obsessed with are actually things that would have been popular when he died in the 90s. So in a weird way, what we might be seeing here is Mark, the real person writer, being immortalized in the character of Mobius by showing him loving the things that he would have loved at that time. And again, if we go back to the Renaissance Fair, this might be kind of a random choice as to where they're going, except for the fact that Renaissance is the French word for reborn. And again, Mobius is a strip that just keeps repeating on itself over and over and over again. And, and do you remember this particular exchange with Ravana? Those rings are already there. And they're all from you. Mobius like, gladly reaches for a coaster in this particular situation and also seems kind of skeptical that the other rings were left by him. It's from your other favorite analyst. Mobius keeps leaving these rings because he's on repeat over and over and over again, which is also why he doesn't remember leaving them and why he doesn't have an agent number because he's the center of it all. He's the tiny cog holding the whole thing together and he himself doesn't even realize it. Which brings us to one of the other questions coming out of episode two. What is Lady Loki up to? Why is she bombing the sacred timeline? I think what's going on here starts with Loki's revelation in this episode, that the TVA has a hole in its security and it has to do with apocalypses. I actually think the way that they demonstrated this particular idea was really well executed because it's kind of complicated to understand at first. It's when they're in Pompeii and Loki can just run out into the middle of the street screaming and release the goats and just be a blatant anachronism because Everyone there is about to die. So despite the fact that they could be seeing something that doesn't make sense with any of their other surroundings, there's no way for that experience with him to reverberate anywhere else into the timeline. But here's where things get fun because Loki has been a part of some apocalypses. Take for example, the beginning of Infinity War where Thanos kills him, an event that our Loki just watched happened at the TVA. But what happens after Loki is killed is an apocalypse. Power Stone is activated and everyone on board dies. Or that is what Loki wants you to believe happened. Because thanks to episode two, we now have an explanation as to how Loki might have escaped here. Duplication casting entails recreating an exact facsimile of one's own body in its present circumstance, which acts as a true holographic mirror of its molecular structure. If the Loki in this situation knows that he is about to be killed by Thanos, it is a really good opportunity to literally duplicate yourself. And it's also a great place to escape into time because he's just discovered that apocalyptic situations are hard for the TVA to realize when something is out of whack. And this exact trick is how Lady Loki has been dodging the TVA for so long by hiding in apocalyptic situations. So in a nutshell, what's happening here is that when Loki lives up to the moment when he knows he is about to be killed by Thanos, what he can do is is duplication cast himself. Meaning Thanos and everyone else, including the TVA, would just think that he is dead because the ship then explodes. It's an apocalyptic situation. But really what's happening here is Loki is standing in the shadows somewhere, having duplicated himself, and can then exit the scene. And in order to ensure that nobody knows he's alive, changes his appearance, something he can do. But okay, that still doesn't totally explain why she's blowing up the sacred timeline. And I think the answer to that is free will. The show's main argument is between the ideas of free will and predestiny. Male Loki is clearly in camp free will, but his main goal of the story is to take over the sacred timeline and therefore predestiny. And this is why Lady Loki scoffs at his invitation because male Loki is thinking too small. He hasn't grasped the truth yet. Ruling the timeline is not her goal. Allowing free will 
is her goal. And that can only exist in a true multiverse, which is why she's bombing 17 and counting moments in the sacred timeline. This act creates tons of opportunities for a branch to redline, and all she really needs for this to happen is one of them to make it. So now the big question becomes, can the TVA respond to all of these at once? I also think that she needs to get to the Time Lords, but not because she specifically wants to rule, but because she doesn't want there to be an opportunity for them to reinforce themselves as the leaders. This is why she took C-20 hostage because she needed to know how to get in. And again, the end result isn't that she is in charge, it is that nobody is in charge. Pure chaos. No chaos? It sounds boring. But guys, for my question of the day, what do you think? Is this the explanation that would help us understand how Loki could have survived the end of Infinity War? Let us know in the towel section down below. But guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so you don't miss out on any future Loki action from us. If you'd like to see Jay and I face off on all of our Loki knowledge, you can check out our Jay versus Ben right over here. Otherwise, until next time, bye.